Hello and welcome back. Let's continue with the work that we've been doing and head on straight back to Visual Studio Code. Let's quickly delete out that console log. And I'm going to actually delete this return as well. The reason being we need to refactor the code slightly now that we understand the different cases that could happen here. And the refactor is going to look something like this. We're going to do a conditional check here on the result. As we saw in the, the last lesson, the result is going to be either simply true or false based on whether that uh, password evaluation or compare function work correctly. And if the case is true that the, the passwords do match, we can return the control back to the passport authenticate handler in the, the login. And the way we're going to do this is return. We'll use this done callback. There are no errors. So we'll say error is null. And at this stage, we can just pass this whole user object back to the, the login authenticate route. Uh, very simply in the else case here, so if the result is false, something went wrong, and then in this case, we can use this done function. We will then pass in a string, and so this error is going to have a truthy value. And so instead of passing null in here, we'll just pass in a string, and this is going to ensure that we have an error. We'll set up something uh, saying password or username is incorrect. And we'll just say something like, please try again. And then for the user value, we'll pass in null just to ensure that it is a falsey value. I think we've done enough work in this verify callback and the passport.use function. We've got all the pieces that we need to continue. Let's head on over back to the router where we need to do a little bit more work here. And just as a quick reminder, this error and user that is coming in here from this, this callback function, is the values from the, the callback done that we setting up in the index.js, the passport.use function. We have three cases. We've got a case where we don't find the user and we return quite early. We're not passing in an error there for a specific reason and we're passing the value false for the user. And this is because this is not necessarily that the authentication failed, it's just we're searching the database for a user that doesn't exist. So we'll handle that in a specific way. And so the second case is that the, the passwords do indeed match and that we have a successful user. So we'll handle that case. And the third case is there is a error. The passwords didn't match or something failed when checking those passwords. So we'll pass an error back and a null value of the user. So previously we kind of just scaffolded out this these two conditional checks. This is where we can actually do the work that we need to do right now. And I'm going to remove these comments so we can type in the code that we need to. And if we do get an error through here, this is the case of the passwords didn't match. So we're going to set up a response here and we'll say response.status. And we're going to send back a 401, which is a generally accepted authorization type code. And on that status, we can just append some JSON and we'll open up an object there. And we'll just give this a a timestamp to conform to the convention of what we have been doing with our API. The message that I want to send back here, we can say something like access denied, username or password is incorrect. And then lastly, we can just append the code of 401. So if we get that error, we're returning a, a nice status and message back to the, the client or whoever's uh, requesting this endpoint. And let's do the same thing in this next check. The So if we do not have a user and that's going to, to match to this conditional here, we can just handle this in a slightly different way. If there was no error and there is no user, we can just send a slightly different message back we can still send back a res response status of 401 and we'll send back some JSON. So I'll open this up with our object and in the same timestamp, we'll say date dot now. And the message, this is where we wanted to handle that in a slightly different way. And I'm just going to simply say unauthorized user and the code in this case will also still be 401. With that last piece of the puzzle, I think we've got a good amount of code in place here just to do some initial tests and checks. So make sure your server is still running. I'm going to just restart it to give us some more space. Let's head on back over to Postman. 
hit that register endpoint to ensure we've got a user. And let's just run through these tests. The order doesn't really matter here, so we don't have to type anything new. Let's just test the case of an incorrect password. So I'm gonna hit send, and you'll see we get back that message that we've just typed here. We're getting back that access denied username or password is incorrect. We do indeed get a 401 unauthorized error. And in Postman, if you hover over there, you can see it just gives you a little bit more information about what 401 actually means. Similar to the 403, but specifically for use when authentication is possible, but has failed or not yet been provided. So I think that matches correctly to what we've set up. So that's the case of an incorrect password. Let's do the correct password. Uh, let's, let me just double check. It is super secret. Just had to remind myself there. Instead of a correct username or email address, I'm just going to remove John from the first part there and see what we get back. And in this case, we get that 401 back with the time span and the, the message here is unauthorized user. So we get back that unauthorized user and that's just saying that username kind of doesn't exist. And then lastly, let's just test the positive case where the, it's the correct username and the, in, and the correct password. I'm gonna hit send. We do indeed get back a 200. We do indeed see the two cookies, the app auth and the app auth.sig. I do just out of interest want to take a look at what's in this uh, base 64 encoded string here. I'm going to use that JWT tool, even though it just it's not a J JWT token, it's just the way we can see what's going on here. If I paste it in, we get that passport key with a user. And now instead of that test that we've had previously, we actually get the the exact ID of that user. So if we see 98A52, we can go back to the register endpoint here and you'll see that that ID is 98A52. So the login worked correctly. It's storing some valuable information now in that app auth cookie that we can start making use of in the rest of our API. And so now we've kind of got the bulk of the, the authentication flow working really nicely now. Obviously, it's just a first pass. There's a lot more testing that will need to be done in order to get this very robust. This is just the idea of, of how it's all kind of working together. There is one more step that we need to implement. So let's just take a short break for now. And I'll see you in the next lesson where we'll talk about how to set up a, the deserialized user function. See you on over there. Cheers for now.